Hey guys, this is episode 135. Today I'm going to be starting part two of my Philippians Bible study that I did with my wife, Stephanie Baker. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter one, verses three through six. We'll talk about what it means to participate in the gospel. We're going to be looking at good works, what that meant from a first century standpoint. I think you're going to be really blessed by this episode. Quick update on my album, Dusk and Dawn. We've got nine songs done. Song uh, 10 is in the works. It's being mixed right now, so please be in prayer for that process. All right, I am blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency along with BDK. You can see all that we do on Omega Frequency Live. Please be sure to tune in this Friday at 8 o'clock Central Time. We're going to be digging into the Didache again. So come check us out there on YouTube again, 8 p.m. Central Time on Friday. Finally, if you want to check out any of my resources, you can find that at philsbaker.com. Well, without any further ado, let's get into episode 135. Hey guys. Hi. <laughs> hey Jen. Hey BDK and Elaine. Blessed and full of joy. Guys, thanks so much for uh for hanging out with us tonight as we're getting into uh the second part of Philippians. Got my lovely wife with me and um she's going to be helping to mod all right, well, let's uh, let's dive in. So if you got a Bible, hey, Andrew, good to see you, brother. If, uh, if you got a Bible, why don't you open it up to Philippians chapter one. And uh, we're going to be tonight looking at verses three through six. But to remind you a little bit of the context that we covered last week, uh, we talked about how Paul and Timothy are writing this letter, though it's mostly Paul writing. They're writing around the year 60 to 61 AD, and Paul is in prison in Rome. Uh, He and Timothy identify themselves as bond slaves or bond servants or just slaves of Christ, their douloi. And um, you can, we, we hit on how Paul is wanting to be like Christ in all things. And that is a term that Paul uses that Christ took upon himself. Uh, We see that in Philippians chapter two, that even though he's in the very nature of God, He didn't consider equality with God as something to be exploited or used to his own advantage, but instead he humbled himself and he took the, he took on himself this idea, this nature of um, a bond servant, this attitude. And so Paul wants us to do that as well as he and Timothy are doing that. And remember he called us saints to the saints at Philippi. And we talked about how that is the term hagios. And it means set apart ones. And we talked about how we are set apart uh, in Christ and set apart for Christ. Um, Hey, Kurt, good to see you, brother. (laughs) Glad you're on here with us tonight. Uh, All right. So, and he said, Tina as well. Oh, hey, Tina. Yeah, glad you can make it tonight. All right. So, we also said um, in Paul's greeting to them, he said, Grace and peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we discussed how putting that in a Roman context, um, Caesar Augustus, earlier in the first century BC, had started this Roman piece, this Pax, uh, Pax Romana, where they were bringing roads throughout the world and they were bringing security and, and uh, provision, prosperity to the countries, to the people groups that would surrender to them and allow Caesar to take over their lands, then he would bless them with different benefactions as we're gonna cover tonight from the Roman Empire. Hey, Natalie, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, and so Paul says, no, there's a true peace from the true Lord. Caesar is not Lord, even though he claims to be. He's not the real son of God, even though he claims to be. There's a real peace that only Jesus can provide. And um, yeah, so let's dive in. We're going to read those verses, verses three through six, and then we'll just kind of hit it word by word, verse by verse. All right. So here's Philippians chapter one, three through six. 
Paul writes, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. All right, so let's dive in. This is verse three. Paul says, I thank my God, singular, in all my remembrance of you. So for Paul to say his God, I mean, he's identifying God. There's one God, right? Singular. Uh, That in itself would be a provocative statement because the Romans are polytheists. You know, they believe in many gods in one sense. And we're not talking about necessarily just the Elohim, um, the plural form of divine beings or whatever, but uh, they believe in Zeus. They believe in in, um, Asclepius. They believe in all these different, and if you're going Roman uh, context, you know, Zeus would be Jupiter or whatever, but they have all these different gods, Demeter, but Paul says, no, there's, there's one God, the ultimate God, and uh, he is Lord of all. For the Romans, the ultimate God for a Roman will actually be the state. That's why they have this empire cult. And um, so when Christians are promoting this monotheism, they're actually viewed as atheists. And uh, Justin Martyr gets into that in his first apology, why the Christians are called atheists. It's a pretty interesting concept, even though they're not. Uh, hey, Jewel, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us tonight. That's awesome. So this word, I think, is Eucharisto. Eucharisto. Does that sound familiar? Eucharist? Yeah, yeah. We're going to get into that yeah. uh, at the end of the Bible study tonight. But uh, so Eucharisto, it means good and grace. It's a combination. And so it's God's grace works well. Um, giving thanks, being thankful for God's good grace. And so it's pretty cool that Paul is someone, he's a leader that practices what he preaches. I don't know if you've been around leaders that say one thing, but don't do the other. Of course, I've been accused of that from time to time. <laughs> you know, It's kind of hard as a parent to always be consistent. But um, you know, Paul is somebody that is consistent. He's a man of integrity. He is a person that practices what he preaches. If you remember uh, in the prison in Philippi, in Acts chapter 16, what are he and Silas doing there uh, in chains after being beaten with rods? They are praising God. Yeah, and praying. They're lifting him up. And um, so like when he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always pray without ceasing in everything, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. When he says that, he's not someone that's speaking like um, just kind of pie in the sky. I mean, he's not saying that this is an ideal that we should strive for, but it's not really attainable. This is someone who actually practices that. He's seen the power of it. And um, so he says he's very thankful for, to God and for God and every remembrance that he has of you. He's giving thanks for God's grace. And um, you can think about that, the way we saw God's grace in uh, in his interactions in Philippi, starting with Lydia. He doesn't have a place to stay necessarily. They've been in Philippi, but they don't have a permanent place. And they meet this woman who's a dealer in purple, which actually means like, even though she's a a God-fearing woman, Like she's a Greek who uh, believes in the one true God and she's practicing Judaism to a a degree. Um, She's a dealer in purple. So she's supplying the fabric for the emperor. Mm -hmm. There are only certain people that can deal in purple. You kind of have to be licensed to do that. And it's kind of interesting that she, after coming to know Christ, begins to work for the one true God in a sense. Mm -hmm. She's dealing, um, she's using her resources to help promote Jesus's kingdom, uh, the one who truly should be wearing the purple. And uh, she opens up her house to Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. And they basically start having house church out of that that home. Thankful for the grace that he saw with the jailer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this man repenting, getting baptized, his whole house in one night. It's pretty amazing. And then he's reminded of the gifts that the church at Philippi had been giving to him, uh, not just while he's been in prison that Epaphroditus took to Paul from the Philippian church. But if you read in Acts, the Philippian church had continued to support Paul even in his next stop, which was Thessalonica. They were sending gifts, even though they were very poor, they were giving out of that poverty. And uh, that just blessed Paul in a tremendous, tremendous way. So um, Paul says he's thankful for God and thankful for them. Um, You know, we're quick to say thanks to people, but it's sometimes a little bit more challenging to thank God, right? Or I think it's not necessarily challenging to thank God for me, but it's challenging to thank God in the difficult times. Mm. And I think he kind of puts those two together in this verse. You know, it's praying without ceasing, even when, you know, he's talking about, you know, we, we know his history with being imprisoned and being beaten and all of these things. And he's still being thankful. Like, I think that we see the blessings as the good things, good things in the eyes of the world, whether that's, you know, something that makes you feel good or something that meets a physical need or whatever it might be that's, you know, very worldly, but he sees it as what is glorifying God. And those are sometimes things that do make us feel good and do meet needs, but it can also be suffering in a lot of ways because Jesus suffered. And why would we think that we're not going to suffer as well? And do we treat even suffering, especially if we're suffering for Christ as something to be thankful for Mm. and something that we can thank God for. Thank you, God, that you have counted me worthy of this suffering. Now I say that and I really hope I don't have to practice that very soon, but I think that that's pretty amazing on Paul's part. Yeah. And Paul actually does that. Yeah. 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 It's very cool. And remembering that he's in prison while he's saying like, every time I think of you, I just thank God. It's a cool thing. So something I wanted to ask, you know, you in the chat, um, you know, what are some things that you're thankful for during this time uh, where you may be kind of feeling like you're in house arrest? So um, yeah, if y'all want to just write in some different things that y'all are thankful for, we'll bring that up. So that's kind of hitting on one aspect of prayer, which is this attitude of like giving thanks uh, to God. Now Paul hits on another aspect of prayer in verse four. He says, he says, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Now this is not just like a thanking God aspect of prayer. This is more supplication. And um, so this roots back to um, Strong's Concordance uh, number 1211, which is day, which means like really, really. So it's it's implying this felt need um, for someone else that's it's personal and urgent, like you're really um, crying out to help uh, to help others, for God to help others. Mm-hmm. And um, hey, Jen, thankful for the fellowship, Jewel. Thank you for the Jenny, yeah, and yeah, all you guys, Elaine, Elaine, Jenny, yeah, yeah. We are so thankful for this this fellowship too, and I thank God. <laughs> Elaine says food as well. Oh man, amen for that. <laughs> amen for that. Absolutely. You know, uh, I thank God that BDK was faithful and brought this up to the mm-hmm. folks in uh, the Fourth Watch and Omega Frequency to um, to make this happen. It's yeah. really cool. What are you thankful for? What am I thankful for in this yeah. time? Yeah, I mean, like one thing we talked about last time, getting to spend more time with our son Daniel. That's been really. That's been really cool. Um, getting to do this Bible study has just been great. Uh, Robert says he's thankful for, what does that say? Having the time to hear, hear the these podcasts, podcasts and for the, his family's health. Yeah, absolutely. And Jewel says a roof over her head as well. Oh man, praise God for that. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Uh, it was one of those, was it in 2009 when the, the ceiling came <laughs> down on New Year's Eve? <laughs> I think it was a little later than that, but it was, yeah, not too long after we had moved into our old house. Yeah, that was... And it was just a torrential down, downpour. Yeah, in and our we, bedroom. <laughs> we feel this drip coming down from the fan mm-hmm. and look up and then... Whoa, and yeah. <laughs> this six-foot portion of I the ceiling I thought we were watching a just, movie when that happened and we heard it in the well, other room. N- 
It's happened more than once, unfortunately, in that yeah, bedroom. Yeah, I was trying to remember which house. time was it. <laughs> We're uh, in a better house now. Praise God. I'm thankful yeah. for that. Uh, I think something I'm thankful for is um, being kind of forced to slow down. Like, mm. I I can, I mean, I can procrastinate things pretty well if I'm, if I'm allowed to. But I think it's been really good to have fewer things on the agenda each day. Like, we don't have to go pick up our kid from track practice or take... Um, take our kid to this or that, um, or even just running errands uh, has changed a whole lot because of that. So um, yeah, I think it's been good to slow down and to kind of have, yeah, a little bit slower pace to life. Absolutely. Tina says um, that the house arrest stuff has, has blessed her immensely because of all the time to slow down and come together with a body in amazing ways. Yeah, and Matthew was saying he's thankful for the opportunity for the remnant to focus on what's really important and living like Jesus and shining his light. That's awesome. And blessed and full of joy says thankful for time to rest as well. Be still with the Lord. For sure. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. It's, I mean, it's really cool that there's so many common themes running in the things we're thankful for. We're thankful for fellowship, um, which... It's it's such a crazy thought because when, you know, the Bible was written or even just probably 20 years ago, 30 years ago, this kind of fellowship wouldn't have been able to take place in this way. But um, it's so different than, you know, what we would have expected, but it's been really, really good. And um, I think that it's interesting that we all are coming away with a lot of the same things we're thankful for. Yeah, Jules says, yeah, the slowdown has been so nice. She recommends Jonathan Ogden's Slow Down song. I don't think I've heard that before, mm-hmm. but there's a there's a song by Robbie C called Slow Me Down. Oh, okay. That is also um, really neat. Really neat. Mm-hmm. Guys, I'm not sure how to... Oh, wait. There it is. I figured it out. Never mind. I was like, I don't know how to take comments off without just clicking to another one. All right. So let's get back in. So um, we're talking about supplication in verse four. He's always supplicating in a sense with joy in all of his supplications for them. So he is a person that feels their need. Um, he feels what they're going through. He really, he's someone who can really say me too, as, as we read, um, or we talked about last week, he says that they're undergoing the same kind of suffering that he is currently. And so they're being persecuted for the faith too. They're struggling, they're having a hard time. And you know, we, we talked about um, giving thanks in First Thessalonians. It's um, this prosukomai, uh, prosukomai, uh, which is give sounds uh, to, delicious. I know prosuko <laughs> uh, it, it means to pray, uh, but it's literally to interact with the Lord by switching your wishes for His wishes. And so this, it's like con- conversing. I almost said conversating, I've but heard, yeah, I've heard that word. Before. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, well, we give <laughs> yeah. thanks, uh, supplicate, conversate. You yeah. know, like it, <laughs> this idea of. Um, God, this is what's on my heart. What's on your heart? And then thinking and listening and meditating on what he's saying and then replying. Really believe, Paul really believes that Jesus will speak to you. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. And uh, I think that's something I can definitely learn from and do better in, not just like throwing things at God, but really taking the time to listen and believing that he's going to talk back to us. So yeah, and he does this with joy. This is kara, uh, which is like the awareness of, of God's grace. Grace recognized, kind of very similar to uh, Cairo, to rejoice. And so, um, again, this is something that Paul and Silas practiced, you know, and, and that led to really making it, it made a big impact on the Roman jailer after the door swung open and they didn't, they hadn't run away. They're still in this attitude of just serving Christ. And he's like, man, what must I do to be saved? So here's another question for y'all. Why do you think it's important for us to pray with joy or with an awareness of God's grace? Why do you think it's important for us to pray with joy or to pray with an awareness of God's grace? Um, I think it's important for us to pray with joy and awareness or an awareness of God's grace. For me personally, I think it's, um, well, because it keeps us from being just like, you know, God, give me this, God, give me that. It's God, thank you for what you've already done. And God, how do you want me to use what you've given me? And instead of like, God, I really need this thing. Um, I think it's a lot more of 
it allows more transformation of us rather than just asking for all kinds of things. Natalie said, we have to acknowledge that he's done something for us. Yeah, um, I think that's that's a really important thing that he is like James 1, I think it's 17 or 18, says that um, every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights which whom, with whom there's no uh, shifting of shadow. There's no change. So like um, he is the author of it. Uh, it's not like there's a greater source above him. Sorry for the hands. But there's not like there's a greater source above God that gives a shadow. Like you can't see it right now, but on my table, there's a shadow. Um, and that's coming from a greater light. But he doesn't change like a shifting shadow. When the sun moves overhead, it would change the place of the shadow. He is the sun. He is the source of every good and perfect gift. So he doesn't change like a shifting shadow. Like they're not the source of it. Uh, like the sun hitting me and my shadow moving. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really good to be aware of that because there's so much that we take for granted. If every single good and if every single gift in our life, every good thing in our life is from God, my goodness, um, he is very, very thankful. And so I think that would really help my art. Sorry. We should be very, very thankful because he is very, very good. Yeah. There we go. All right. (laughs) He's consistent. Absolutely. Yeah. There's so many things to be thankful for. And I think that that's, we come at it with an attitude of joy. We become, um, I don't know, more aware of that. I, I think there's been like a practice before where you go through and you write everything that you're thankful for. I've seen this, you know, I've done this a couple of times and just, you think that like, once you get past those first few, like my family, my friends, my job, my house, whatever, once you start actually start thanking him for every single thing, mm. I think you get to this deeper awareness that, beyond these temporal things, beyond even people, because people are temporary and um, they're a great blessing, but we're not promised that they'll be there tomorrow. Mm. Um, We get a lot more understanding of who God is and what he, what he does for us and what he does to, um, to bless us. And um, a lot of that is just our personal transformation and realizing the gift that we have in Christ that, um, that we, that, you know, can't be taken away from us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I think Matthew wrote, I think praising God and praying with genuine joy in every circumstance, even in tribulation is a really powerful spiritual weapon against our true enemy. Mm. Absolutely. It makes you like, think about why Jesus spent so much time in prayer right? Really trying to see things from his father's perspective um, and who's the greatest spiritual warrior ever, you know? So I think that's something I could definitely work on. Um, Oh, Jewel said, I've seen so many come to salvation through Jesus lately. Praise God for that. Yeah. I mean, that's such an, that's such a powerful example of God's character, right? Because while we were enemies, Christ died for us while we were following the power of the air, the prince of the power of the air, like we're disciples of Satan, as Ephesians 2 talks about, I mean, God saved us not by our works, which is a word we're going to get into in a little bit, but because of his grace, right? God, um, after Jesus calls us to love our enemies in Matthew chapter 5, he says, because your father, our father, uh, sends rain on the evil and the good. He caused the sun to shine on the evil and the good. And... um, so that's just incredible. Like he loves his enemies and we were by nature objects of wrath before receiving God's grace and him choosing to pursue us and uh, reach out to us while we were against him. I mean, praise God for all those salvations that you're seeing. Mm. Tina says, uh, Stephanie, that's my greatest struggle. I love people and sharing in the Lord with them so much. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, Lanisha. Yeah, welcome. Thanks so much for joining. Ren 1010, in all things give thanks. I'm thankful for his refining fire. Man, it's, it's, it feels kind of tough when you're going through it, but you look back and you're like, man, 
after I can kind of see things from God's perspective, I can see how important that was. Yeah, yeah that's, absolutely. It's like a, a, a tumor being removed from a, by, a sur- or by a surgeon. You think you're okay mm. with it there. And the thought of going through surgery sounds terrible. But once it is removed, you realize that you are missing out on certain things in life. And you realize that things weren't as normal or they weren't correct, I guess. They weren't the way they should be. And things are made right afterward. Yeah, and we're a bigger blessing to the people around us as well. Right. I know Stephanie is more thankful for God's refining fire in me Amen. than I am. <laughs> yeah. Refine away, Lord, on Phil. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Audrey, thanks so much for joining us tonight. All right, so let's keep going. We're in verse five now. Uh, so Paul is uh, so thankful as he remembers uh, the Philippians and he's offering prayer with joy in every prayer for them uh, in view of their participation in the gospel from the first day until now. This is such a neat phrase. I'm really excited about this and I'm about to nerd out a little bit. So uh, so hang on for a second. Um, so this participation is koinonia. If you've heard that word koinonia, you probably know it's fellowship. It's Greek word for fellowship. It means this, uh, what is shared in common on the, as the basis of fellowship, partnership. It's partnership, participation, all right? Now, it's participation or partnership in the gospel. That's euangelion, uh, literally God's good news. And the gospel of the kingdom is the main theme of Jesus' preaching. He talks about it over a hundred times uh, in the gospels. It's either the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel, the kingdom of God or the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Either way, that is the main theme of his message. And there's a real Greek flavor to it. So I want to read you a little something out of a book that I really like, Wait, but this is a- Who's what, that book by? Oh, so this is by Shane Claiborne. Wow. I think we talked about that guy Yeah, it's earlier. called <laughs> Jesus for President. It's a really, really neat uh, book. So I want to read y'all a um a little excerpt about Caesar Augustus and this uh, this um it was chiseled on the ruins of a government building in Asia Minor uh, around 6 BC so this is what they were saying about Caesar Augustus in 6 BC listen to this the most divine caesar we should consider equal to the beginning of all things For when everything was falling into disorder and tending toward disillusion, he restored it once more and gave the whole world a new aura, Caesar, the common good fortune, capital F, fortune of all, the beginning of life and vitality. I mean, if you're not hearing how blasphemous this is, right? For a Jew to hear this or for a Christian, you know, several decades later to hear this. But this is what they believed about Caesar. All right. (laughs) I'm going to keep going. It says, Mm -hmm. all the cities unanimously adopt the birthday of the divine Caesar as the new beginning of the year. So all (laughs) of time changes. Yes. With that. Okay. Yeah. Whereas the providence which has regulated our whole existence has brought our life to the climax of perfection in giving to us the emperor, Augustus, Mm. who being sent to us and our descendants as savior has put an end to war and has set all things in order. And whereas having become God manifest, Caesar has fulfilled all the hope of earlier times. They and just the, have no problem claiming that title, do they? God manifest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah. Same thing they're saying about Caesar Augustus now, a mm-hmm. um, uh, hundred and sixty years later or so. The birthday of the god Augustus has been for the whole world the beginning of the good news. Let that sink in. That's the culture that Paul is writing to in Philippi. And Philippi being a Roman colony, 
very much was participating in the gospel of Caesar. BDK says Caesar's making Rome great again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but even bigger yeah. than like the most um, passionate Trump enthusiasts are. Yeah. Far more. And it wasn't so divided. I mean, it was empire-wide mm. holding him up as God. All right? So let me give a little more background into uh, Philippi and how it became a colony. I'm going to go back to Caesar Augustus's adopted dad, Julius Caesar, okay? So after his victory in Gaul, Julius Caesar came into, into Rome declaring himself emperor in 46 BC. Rome was a republic at that time, and this greatly angered the Roman Senate. A few years later, they decided to murder him on March 15th. Uh, Brutus and Cassius murdered him and then fled to go raise an, an army. So Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, who later is known as uh, Caesar Augustus, uh, and Mark Antony, one of the main generals of Rome, they also raised an army and the two sides met at Philippi to decide the fate of Rome. Will it be a republic or will it be an empire? Well, they had two battles and on the second battle, Octavian and Caesar Augustus, Octavian and Mark Antony won. Now, several years later, uh, I believe almost 10 years later, uh, Octavian and Anthony had a battle and Octavian, Octavian, sorry, Octavian. <laughs> is that like when they're a couple? Yeah, but they're not though. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> you just had a dyslexic moment. Wow. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, yeah, that's one of the ways that God causes all things to work together for good. Yeah. I've seen so many times when I'm teaching or giving a message or something and I'm being really serious and I haven't like added humor into it at all. Somehow dyslexia comes in to create a uh, scar Joe or something like that. <laughs> Just like this blend. I, that's not even a blend. That's that's her name, right? Scarlett Johansson. Phil, Give you me a blend. To just move on. Like Brangelina. Brangelina. Classic. Okay, thanks. Good job. Thanks for saving me. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move back on. Back to the text. Back to the, well, <laughs> back, back to, to the history. commentary. Yeah. All right. So uh, Caesar Augustus, uh, was crowned Lord and God after his uh, victory with Octavian. And coins around the empire start calling him the savior of the world, helping bring in the Pax Romana. His gospel says that peace and security has come and the empire cult really begins to take off. The gospel has come through the dominator, Caesar. And so Caesar Augustus, Octavian, uh, he, made Rome, he made Philippi a Roman colony. And um, what? And so, basically, he, he asked a lot of the veterans from that that earlier war against Brutus and Cassius. He asked them to come and uh, to make Philippi their home, and he would make Roma, uh, sorry, Philippi a Roman colony. And so, what that would mean is he wants to build up Philippi in such a way that if you if you came to Philippi, it was like you were coming to Rome itself. Okay. He wanted Philippi to be a reflection of Rome. And so think about as patriotic and nationalistic as things would be in Rome mm -hmm. under Caesar Augustus. That's how he wanted it to be in Philippi. And like the city is populated by war veterans. All right. So that's the kind of climate that you have in Philippi. Okay. Very, very uh, tough place to live as someone who's saying, um, yeah, Caesar Augustus, he's not, he's not Lord. Right. Caesar Augustus, he's not the Savior. Caesar Augustus um, has promoted fake news. His gospel is fake gospel. Yeah. Um, he does not bring us peace. Pax Romana is a fraud. Think about saying any of those things in a place like Philippi. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's scary right now to truly stand up and to do the things that Jesus calls us to. But this was, this was a even, I mean, like we have so much more freedom in the U S to, to kind of dissent than you do in, you know, this time in Philippi and they're putting their lives on the line so much. I mean, like you're, you really are not allowed to have much of your own opinion. Your opinion is what we tell you your opinion is. I mean, with certain things, at least with, government officials. This is not a government official. This is God's 
son. This is mm-hmm. God incarnate. Like this is all of these things that we as Christians reserve for our savior. This political leader is that. So to say otherwise is to put yourself in danger. Big time danger, big time. So remember that Paul said that the Philippians were participating in the gospel. And he said that they were undergoing the same things as him. But let's come back to this participation, this fellowshipping uh, in the gospel. You remember we talked about Lydia, how she is helping to advance the real gospel by opening up her home and using her resources to promote the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, using, um, and it, it's really cool, uh, by the way, in verse 14, I'm sorry, I get sidetracked sometimes. No, I like this comment from Lanisha. Caesar, Caesar, I can't even say it. Caesar, Caesar, he's not the man. He can't do it. Jesus can. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. That's cute. Like Amen that. to that. Um, in verse 14 in Acts 16, Acts 16 verse 14, it talks about God opening our heart. We're going to come back to that uh, in just a little bit. But remember, the Roman jailer also participated in the gospel, uh, declaring Jesus as Savior. He says, sirs, after, um, after the door is open, he's going to kill himself. Paul says, no, don't do it. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Remember, uh, as a Roman, he would, already, he would believe that he already was saved that Caesar is the savior of the world. Mm -hmm. Like you're living in heaven on earth, basically. You remember all that stuff that we read uh, carved onto the altar in 6 BC in Asia Minor. You know, so for him to say, no, I need to be saved. It's like saying, I was born. No, I need to be born again, right? It's it's that kind of a, what? What are you talking about? Kind of like Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? How can I enter my mother's womb a second time? Mm -hmm. For him to say, I need to be saved. And remember what Paul says. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. This is not easy believism, what Paul is saying. And I know that passage is used a lot in a modern context to say, just believe in Jesus. Yeah, it's like a mental decision. That's, I mean, it's just, it's all it is. It's like, believe, like you're going to believe in Santa Claus or whatever. It's just this. Yeah, but for the jailer, for him to say, Jesus is my Lord now. Right. He's just signed his death warrant. I mean, he is a he's going to be a marked man. Mm-hmm. And what's really cool is that immediately he goes and he gets baptized. That night, he goes and gets baptized. And for an early Christian, baptism was like the main way that you profess with your mouth. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe that God in your heart, that God raised him on the third day. Mm-hmm. The main way that you profess with your mouth that Jesus was Lord was baptism. It's a transfer of allegiance. You're coming out of the kingdom of Caesar into the kingdom of Jesus. It's, again, if you go to places like Iran or Saudi Arabia or India, any place where it's like illegal to be a Christian, If you get baptized, you just, you're a marked person, a marked man or a marked woman or a marked child. Um, I know of a missionary in India, when he baptizes people, they say, um, they have people recite uh, by in life and in death to my very last breath after confessing Jesus as their Lord, right? Those like main uh, tenets uh, of doctrine in life and in death, will you follow him in life and in death to your very last breath? Yeah, say? no, I just, I mean, it's it's such a public thing. Like like Joel just said, public profession. Like it was something, especially then, I mean, there was, there were, the word travels quickly. And in these communities where everybody is connected, um, this event happening, I mean, I don't know how much they'd advertise it ahead of time, but it was just like, hey, I just saw this going down. I saw Phil down by this, you know, by the river, Looks like he's going to get baptized. I mean, it was a very obvious thing. It wasn't like it could be mistaken for something else. It's not like he could step back and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It wasn't what it looked like. We just went for a swim. Like this was a very obvious, like you said, change of allegiance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's how one way that he was participating in the gospel, uh, furthering it. But then, you know, um, they continued to support Paul as a missionary. This is 
something we're going to cover a little bit later in uh, Philippians, but in Philippians 4, uh, 15, chapter 4, verse 15, he says, you yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone, for even in Thessalonica, you sent me a gift more than once to meet my needs, not my greeds. (laughs) But yeah, so in Acts 16, they go to Philippi. The very next place they go is Thessalonica. And so this very poor church sends money to help support Paul who's not trying to get rich off the gospel at all. You know, you will see him, like when he gets to Corinth, he will work. Um, He begins to uh, build tents with Aquila and Priscilla, right? So he is not afraid of having a real job, Mm -hmm. Um, but they want to support him so they can really focus on, um, on preaching the gospel. Yeah, Matthew Marcel said, uh, moving from, a change of allegiance uh, from government and nation to a change of allegiance to the uh, the King Jesus and his kingdom. Sorry, I butchered what you wrote, Matthew, but that's right on the money. Dyslexia stings again. All right. Um, yeah. So let me ask y'all some stuff. What What are some things that we can do to participate in the gospel? What are some things that we can do to participate in the gospel? What do you think, Steph? What's something that comes to your mind? Um, Well, I think that there's a lot of um, scripture that talks about, um, well, religion is looking after widows and orphans. And I think that there's a lot that we can do to serve um, those that may or may not have family. You know, the widows, they were, they weren't just people who had lost spouses. They didn't have anyone taking care of them. So um, I think right now, in the culture that, you know, in our current climate, in our culture, we're very isolated. And people that don't have family right now are suffering hard. Like, I think as much as it's frustrating for people to be, you know, stuck inside their house with their family, with their kids going crazy, there are people that would love to have that. They Mm. would love to have that kind of craziness in their home just to, to not be alone. So I think that they're looking out for people that are alone, those that are older or maybe those that that don't have family. I think calling on them, checking on them, um, and encouraging them in difficult times. Mm, mm. Hey, thanks for the uh, the encouragement, <laughs> uh, Tina and Matthew. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. So let's think about some different things we can do. Like, how can you be creative to demonstrate the gospel to your neighbors? How can you be creative in um, in preaching the gospel um, in this time, in supporting people that are trying to further the gospel? How can you do that? Um, Jewel says, one thing I do is talk to people in the grocery stores. Most people are afraid. The gospel gives hope. I've met new friends who are interested in the hope of salvation. That's great, Jewel. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, when people are at the grocery store, you know they're already a little bit anxious. Am I going to catch something mm-hmm. from somebody? Are the supplies that I need going to be there? Um, people are just a little bit on edge when they're there. And so if you can just talk to them, uh, that sense of community there, and then like asking them questions, uh, talking about the gospel, the reason for your hope, being ready to give a defense, the reason for the hope that you have in Christ, apologetic discussions can happen in the grocery store, even on like a, whether it's a deep level or just like an encouraging letter level where you're just, you're shining, yeah, you know, for Christ there. That's awesome, Jewel. Yeah. Very cool. That's really good. Yeah. What about uh, you, Phil? You got anything? Ways that we can participate in the gospel? Yeah. Something I mean, like, creative, like you were talking about. Well, like BDK gave this great idea right here. Um, I would never have thought about doing this. Um, just doing a little Bible study yeah. with you. And I think it's really cool that you've joined on. So it's not just me talking, but we're getting some live interaction mm-hmm. and uh, you're able to give um, a different perspective to what's going on. I, I just think that's that's really neat. So um, yeah, uh, let's, let's jump in uh, to the last verse, okay? 
last verse. We're doing great on time. It's probably one of the first verses that I memorized um, as a kid in Sunday school. Verse six, I'm confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I promise you, this is much deeper than what you were taught in Sunday school. It's, at least it was for me, uh, what we're about to get into um, with the idea of good works. But I don't want to jump the gun yet. Uh, let's go kind of word by word. I'm confident in this very thing. When Paul says he's confident, um, that's uh, patho, I believe, or pietho. No, I think it's patho. And it comes from the word pistis, uh, which is mouth. faith or faithfulness. And what it really means is to persuade, to be persuaded of, to be persuaded of something that is trustworthy. And so the Lord persuades the yielded believer to be confident in his preferred will. And uh, I know who, I'm, who I've believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep th that which I've committed uh, to him against that day. That same idea of being persuaded there He's persuaded because of God's character and God's faithfulness. He knows who he has believed. So he is persuaded, right? That God is able. Do you know God like that? Mm -hmm. That he can persuade you so easily? Like it, it takes more, more than it took Paul. For me, it takes more sometimes for God to persuade me. Um, sometimes when he's asking me to do something that I'm... Uh, that I'm struggling with or that I view as tough or challenging. Yeah, I think that's definitely true for me. I I think I I second guess and I I think it comes in my head it's being humble, but in reality it's doubting God's faithfulness to carry through something that he started. So I mean, I know for for us like in our marriage there's been a lot of times where I've been like, "Hey, I have this idea." and then been like, "Ah, eh, never mind." And like, you know, God's used you in a lot of ways to encourage me to know, like, that's there for a reason. Like, you should, you could do that. You, you know, you're, you're more than capable of doing that. And if God is calling you to do that, he's going to bless it. And so I think that's an important thing. Community, it's not just you. I mean, you're, you're great. You're around a lot more than anybody else, but, <laughs> but there's, you know, girlfriends in my life too. And there's been people in, small groups that we've been a part of or others. And it's, it's really important that um, we have people around us that are going to help fan that flame. You know, God has put something within us and he's, he's going to do something great through us if we'll submit ourselves and do what he's calling us to do. And um, yeah, I think those people are so valuable because I don't have that for myself all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and you said God had put something in us. Yeah. And that, Paul is confident that he who began mm -hmm. the good work in us. And by the way, that you world, you word, he who began a good work in you is actually plural. He's talking to the church. Mm -hmm. But it's also true individually. Right. Um, he who began it, he who started it. Remember in, with Lydia in Acts chapter 16, um, it says that God opened her heart to respond to uh, the things spoken by Paul. So God had been seeking her out, right. this woman. And he didn't just seek her out, but he opened her heart to be able to believe. And I think about that passage in, uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, maybe verse 4, that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving right? To not see the, the glory of the, good, of, of the gospel or of the glory of Christ. And, um, oh man, BDK. <laughs> but did Phil just get the subtle okie doke? <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so God's got to open it up. No one can come to, to the father unless the father draws him first, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something really powerful to think about the goodness of God, that God opens our heart. God begins these things in us. And um, I just wanted to read something out of 2 Timothy chapter 1. I want you to think about all the things that Paul is saying that God does. 
All right. It's going to start in verse seven with a verse that I know we're all familiar with, but it's second Timothy chapter one, verse seven through 12. All right. And every word of scripture is true. I may not be a, uh, a Calvinist, <laughs> but man, I believe every word of scripture. And man, if this is a passage that would kind of make you want to lean toward that way. And every word of it is true. So let's, let's, uh, let's read 2 Timothy 1, 7. It says, or 1, 7 to 12. It says, for God, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but he has given us a spirit of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So God's going to give you the power to suffer for the gospel because, verse 9, God has saved us. God has called us with a holy calling and not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who did what? Who abolished death, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed. So he didn't do that. Jesus appointed Paul a preacher. He appointed him an apostle, and he appointed him a teacher. For this very reason, I suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. For I know who I have believed, and I am persuaded, convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Think of all the stuff that God does in us, how he not only begins that work, but he is able to complete that work in us. And speaking of the word work, good work, let's get into those two words. So good right? For I'm convinced of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Good is the word agathos, which means inherently or intrinsically good. As to the believer, it describes what originates from God and is empowered by him in their life through faith. So this good work is intrinsically good because it it um, proceeds from the only one who is intrinsically good, all right? God alone, as Jesus would say in Matthew 19 uh, to the rich young ruler, he said, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And of course he's saying, uh, I am God. I'm not just a good teacher, I'm God. But anyway, so it's a good, intrinsically good work. And this word work means ergon, or is ergo or ergon, to work or accomplish, a work or worker who accomplishes something. It's a deed that carries out an inner desire or purpose. So it's a work that has a purpose. It has a desire to accomplish something. Now, we're going to break that down a little bit more in a Christian sense in, in, a, in a second. But first, this term, good work, is a Roman term. All right, we talked about when uh, someone would come to a city like, like Philippi, and Caesar says, I'm going to make y'all a Roman colony. The reason he would do that um, would be to have it reflect the nature of Rome. And in order to do that, he's going to give Philippi certain benefactions. These are called good works. These benefactions are good works. Well, what would that be? Well, Caesar would give them aqueducts. Like you got aqueducts in Rome. Well, he's going to give them paved streets because you got paved streets in, in Rome. He's going to give you magnificent temples like they have in Rome. He's going to give you statues of Caesar. He's going to give you theaters. He's going to give you uh, the imperial games, right? He's going to give all the things to this colony to make it look like Rome had come to Philippi. 
So these good works are given to reflect the nature of and character of Rome. Now, if you're not getting that connection yet, you will soon. It's given by Rome to represent him. Well, why does God begin this good work in us? Why is God doing these benefactions in us? Well, Ephesians 2 Verse eight, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast, not your works. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. So he's speaking to the whole church and he's saying, I'm giving you my spirit and I'm putting a work in you because I called you to be an ambassador of heaven, right? As Paul says in Philippians chapter three, you're a citizen of heaven. Why? Because he's trying to show the world what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he does that by working in us the seed of heaven in a sense, like the mustard seed that's supposed to grow and grow and grow until it totally takes over us. And so that we would then show those good works to the world. Think about a visitor coming in to, to Philippi. He would be like, oh my goodness, this is a Roman, this is what Rome, I've never been to Rome and yet Rome has come to me. Mm. I've never been to heaven. How can heaven come to us? You know, that's the way that the people around us should, that's the kind of experience that they, that God wants those people to have so that they can see heaven through us. You got any thoughts right now? I need to take a drink. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, I, that kind of reminds me of like the world fair kind of thing. Like they're bringing these things to represent or to, you know, a smaller version of something that exists elsewhere to folks that wouldn't be able to experience it otherwise. And I think that, you know, there's a very small percentage, very, very, very like minusculely small percentage of people who ever interacted with Jesus throughout the course of history. However, through the disciples, we were able to see these good works carried out and then the disciples made more disciples and, and so on and so forth. And Um, I think about, I mean, everybody's probably seen these like little maps where they show how the coronavirus spread and it's like insane. And it's crazy that it started in, in China and then it's like made its way to basically every country around the world, you know, Um, obviously not to every country, but it's making its way and how quickly it's happened and how, um, yeah, just how, how it's changed the whole world. And when you think about that in light of the gospel, like how could our world be transformed? I mean, we obviously interact with more people who interact with more people that we have no knowledge of. I mean, (laughs) just that's what this virus is showing us is we don't even realize how many people we come in contact with. Um, But I think that that is, yeah, that's our good works or our things that we do that bring heaven to earth or bring life, our are testifying to God's goodness and they are transforming the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Caesar was also trying to transform the world, right? Into the image of Rome. And you can imagine being in Philippi and Caesar Augustus says, look, I'm making y'all my colony. I'm going to give you all these benefactions, okay? I'm going to give you endless resources from me, from Caesar, because, man, I'm, I'm Lord of, of all, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm Savior. So, you may not have the, I'm going to give you all these resources to build these temples, to build these stadiums, to build the statues, to build the aqueducts, all of that stuff, to pave the streets. Now, I'm going to come and visit y'all in five years. I got, I'm going to give you five years to do this. Endless resources from me. You know, in five years, when Caesar's coming to visit Philippi, you know those um, workers are going to want to have it reflecting the kingdom when he comes, right? Going to want it reflecting the kingdom of, of Caesar when he comes. Well, Paul says that I am confident that he who began a good work in you, the real ultimate Caesar, the real savior of the world, the real Lord is going 
to complete it. He's going to complete it. Now, that word uh, epitaleo uh, comes from this word telos. Telos, which means to bring to maturity, to bring to completion, something that we're going to actually talk about a little bit um, on Friday when we do the seven words from the cross and when Jesus says, it is finished, to telestai. It has a root in that too, which we'll get to um, that day. But uh, to bring to completion, to bring to maturity, that Jesus's goal is to transform us into his image. Think about uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. Now the Lord is the spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we with, all, with, with unveiled faces are being transformed into the image of the Lord uh, from glory to glory, uh, who is the spirit, right? So progressively being transformed uh, into Jesus's image, just like Caesar would be transforming Philippi from glory to glory, in a sense, into the image of Rome, uh, one benefaction at a time. Uh, Jesus is transforming us individually and us corporately to look more and more like heaven on earth. Uh, one of the main ways you see that is in Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse 11. Ephesians chapter four. Oh, yeah, um, Matthew says, we are Jesus's address. As BDK says, we die to ourselves so he can live through us. Amen, brother, amen. So Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse 11, uh, Paul writes, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, same word there, same word, uh, as um, you see in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that um, uh, epitaleo, yeah, same same word. All right. Uh, I just lost my place. I'm sorry. To the mature man, to the mature, uh, to the measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And once we're there, what, what would be the result? Well, as a result, we would no longer be uh, children tossed here and there by waves and carried out by every evil wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceit and scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So, um, Let me ask a question real quick. How well do we look like citizens of heaven? Does this American church look like citizens of heaven? Looks like, does it look like a colony of heaven? And what can we do as American Christians to look more like a colony of heaven? Can you say that again? Yeah, so how well do we as the American church look like a colony of heaven? And what can we do to look more like a colony of heaven? Um, I think that if we look like just a gathering of American folks, then we don't look like the church. We don't look like a colony of heaven. I think it's, um, we're going to look strange. That's what we're told we should look. We should be weird. We should be aliens, you know, is the word that's used. And I don't think it, it does. I think we, we try to, you know, and, and I'm not against like trying to draw people into church necessarily, but when that's our, our whole, fo our whole fo <laughs> words are hard sometimes. <laughs> it's rubbing off on you. I'm sorry. It is. Yeah. Uh, when that's our whole focus, we, we've lost a lot of our potency as a church. We've, um, we've given them uh, like a little dose like a small amount of Christianity, like a little nugget rather than like the gospel, which transforms lives. We give them that little bit that may make them feel good, like a like a placebo almost, like a little pill that makes you feel good for a bit, but it doesn't 
do anything for them. It doesn't really change their lives. So, um, yeah, I don't, I think we fail in a lot of ways um, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to, um, to care about a lot of, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways, but there are some, there's some good things that the American church does too. But yeah, we have a lot of ways that we've, we've watered things down so much that it loses its potency. Mm, Amen. I like that song. I want to be different. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. If y'all are hearing our little dog, Amos, I'm sorry about that. (laughs) He, uh, he's lonely downstairs and he's upset that I got, I got Zeke up here. Which you can hear him snoring. Yeah, sometimes. you might hear him snoring. He's like right behind me, but he's pretty quiet when I come up here. Do almost all of my podcasts, Ready With An Answers, all up here with Zeke. Um, I don't know, he just really likes it. If if he's by me, he won't say a word. Yeah. Not that he would talk normally <laughs> in English, but... I, I think it's he's also there for your support. Maybe so. I need that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Um now, remember, I was talking about how if, if like Caesar Augustus said to Philippi, look, I'm going to give you all these resources. I'm going to give you everything you need, but in five years, I'm going to come see it. Well, there's a day that Jesus is returning to see what's up. Mm. How do we do? You know, uh, blessed and full of joy says, uh, no, the American du- church doesn't look like it should. The church has conformed so much to the world to bring them in but forgot to realize that we should be different. Amen. And, you know, Paul really hits on that in uh, Ephesians 4 when he talks about how he gave the gifts to the church for the, to the, to the church for the building up of the church. So like the church service, the gathering of believers really is for the equipping of the saints, not for the attraction of the unsaved. Mm-hmm. Our gatherings are not supposed to be for the unsaved. We're supposed to be what attracts the unsaved in our regular lives. If if you're reading Paul in Ephesians 4, it's supposed to be us out there in the world that are looking like citizens of the colony of colony of heaven, right? Um, Attracting them, but our gatherings are supposed to be equipping the believers. And maybe that's one of the main reasons why the church is so watered down and weak and not fulfilling its purpose around the world or or in in some places in America. I don't want to overgeneralize. There are some really, really great churches here in America. And there are lots of places where, I mean, any one of us would be really challenged by how they're truly living out the gospel. Um, I think what you're referring to is more of the, the corporate mentality toward churches and, um, the, the, the churches that many people are familiar with. Um, they don't have to be a mega church to be watering down the gospel, but um, any church that is doing that is, is missing the point of the church. Yeah, so Paul says that um, Jesus is going to bring us to completion. He's confident that the good work that Jesus began in us, the benefaction that Jesus began in us, he's going to complete it, to perfect it, to mature it until the day of Christ Jesus. So I just want to highlight a couple of passages of scripture as we're kind of bringing this to a close. I want to highlight a couple of passages of scripture about the return of Jesus and uh, what's going to go down. Uh, The first one, and then we'll just ask a few a few questions, and then I'll give a final challenge. So the first passage is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 6. And it's Paul says, For after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. Gosh, that dog. 
Yeah, he's really wanting some attention. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry for that. Um, but yeah, he is coming to be glorified in his saints. Are we glorifying him as his saints now? Because when that day comes, there's no second chances. Second passage is Philippians chapter 3. Uh, kind of hitting at what it looks like to be glorified in his saints, all right? So Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. And I don't think Paul is talking to about people who don't profess to be Christians, but rather people who do profess to be Christians. For our citizenship is in heaven, not our other citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven from whom also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has given even to subject all things to himself. So he's saying, follow his example. Follow his example as he's following Christ. Don't set your mind on earthly things. Set your mind on heaven, on the king of heaven, Jesus, who's coming to glorify himself through us to transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. He's trying to change us to be more and more like him. And that's supposed to start as soon as we give our lives to him. So um, just kind of try to wrap it up. Jesus Christ uh, is the savior of all men, especially those who believe, as Paul writes in 1 Timothy. And what that's getting at is that not that everybody is saved, but he has died so that everyone can partake in, in his saving grace. Um, because all people are valuable to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he died for our sins, but not just for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. As uh, John writes in First uh, John chapter two, and so uh, as Paul has been growing more and more into the likeness of Christ, it's almost like he kind of starts talking like Jesus. He starts using similar words that Jesus would use, have, doing similar things that Jesus would do. And there's a connection. There's a distinct connection between um, what Paul is saying in these verses in Philippians one. And in what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, when he's talking about the Lord's Supper, when he's talking about communion, remember in Philippians 1.3, he said, I, Eucharisto, I thank my God. And this Eucharist idea, this communion, giving, giving thanks for God, excuse me, and all my remembrance of you all always offering with prayer and joy, my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel because he's confident that he who begins a good work in us will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So he's got this Eucharisto, this thankfulness, this calling us to remember participating in the gospel until Jesus's return. Think about what he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had Eucharisto, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eucharisto, giving thanks, remembering participating in the gospel. Take this, my body, you participate in this with me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood from Jeremiah 31. This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Eucharist is a time when we give thanks for who Jesus is and what he has done. When we remember that, when we participate with him until he comes back, the day of Christ. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are like the two main ways that, um, two of the main ways that we participate in the gospel. Baptism and the Lord's Supper and two analogies that I've used to connect these, the importance of these, um, these events, these things that we do uh, to people is saying that baptism is like a wedding. It's like a marriage. It's this public profession of a transfer of allegiance, forsaking all others, right? For richer or poor, in sickness and health, right? All of these words, this transfer of allegiance to someone. And it's one of the reasons why I've told people, you know, if, if you're not willing to like wear a wedding ring in one sense, or get the tattoo, whatever you want to do. But it's like putting on a wedding ring, baptism is. And if you're not ready ready to wear that everywhere, you're not ready to be married. You know, you don't take the wedding ring off when you go to the club. You know, you don't take it off when you go to work. If you're not willing to show your allegiance everywhere you go, you are definitely not ready to be married. And if you're not willing to make that public profession of Jesus in view of everyone, in life and in death to your very last breath. You're not ready to follow Jesus yet. Like that's not going to be a public profession that saves you if you're not willing to go out there, in my opinion. Of course, you got like thief on the cross kind of thing. Yeah. But if you're not willing to profess him, you're you're not really submitting to him as Lord. So baptism is like putting on that wedding ring. It's marriage. The Lord's Supper is like renewing your vows. Baptism is like the wedding ring. Lord's Supper is like renewing your vows. Reminding yourself of what brought you together in the first place. Reminding yourself of what's going to keep you together. What kept you together? What's going to keep you together? And that you are committed forever, eternally. And so when you take that Lord's Supper, you're thanking God that, man, while I was his enemy, he was laying down his life for me. And as committed to me as he was then, he's just as committed to me now. And even when I have nothing to offer seemingly, seemingly, even if I was like so old, even if I had lost my mind, even if um, I was incapable of speaking, he would still be committed to me. Because of that, I'm giving my life to you. I mean, I'm, it's like a recommitment um, in, in a sense. Every time, I'm going to see you that day, that, that day when you return, and what a day that's going to be. find you, Lord. I don't want this broken world. I just want to find you, Lord. So come for me, come for me. My Redeemer, my Defender, my Creator, He knows my name. My Provider, from my child.
You seek us, you save us, you make us your family. You seek us, you save us, you make us your family. You seek us, you save us, you make us your family.